Okay, so welcome to this Robotics One class in this blended modality. Uh, my name is Alessandro De Luca. Uh, I'm teaching this course since its birth in Ex Sapienza, so many, many years. So uh, this year we will have uh, some changes because of this type of modality. Uh, you will see that I will skip some of the material uh, of my slides, uh, but you will find uh, the full presentation on the course website. So, let me see if this works. No? Yes, this works. Yeah, okay. So, uh, first of all, we started later, and uh, so we will have only 11 weeks of uh, classes uh, on Tuesday and Friday. Uh, I'm expecting here people that have, uh, that are either from the Master in Artificial Intelligence and Robotics or from the Master in Control Engineering or in any case if you have uh, this course in your uh, study plan. So we will do more or less 50 hours of lectures uh, intertwined with exercises we will do also a midterm test, a remote midterm test, in fact, uh, as we did in the uh, second semester of last year for a robotics two course. So, uh, if you want to come in, pre in presence, as your colleagues have done, uh, you have to sign uh, on the Sapienza webpage for that, so in Zoom B2, otherwise we will use Zoom. And please, as I uh, clarified several times. Uh, as soon, uh, if you have a uh, Uniroma One account, please enter through that so that you enter into the meeting as soon as it starts. Uh, if you don't have one yet, then there will be a temporary uh, uh, access. So I will allow everybody, but at some point I will uh, switch and only those who are explicitly invited by me will have access, okay? So please, uh, if you can, use as soon as possible the Uniroma One account. Uh, so uh, we have also uh, a number of ways of getting material or getting in contact with me. So I have a personal YouTube channel uh, on the PDF that you have on the website you can click on those links and you will be brought there directly. So uh, I will personally re record the uh, lecture, but I don't know if I'm going to put them on that channel. You will find uh, Robotics 2 lectures there uh, recorded during the lockdown. So now we try to move uh, away from that and having only online. Uh, but just in case, there will be some recording. So uh, in order to get access to uh, this, you have to uh, join the Google group, uh, again, with your Uniroma One account. So all the material will be found on the course website. You can contact me by mail, of course, and there are office hours for students. Now, depending on uh, uh, the evolution of uh, the pandemia, this will be in presence in my room or remote through uh, Google Meet. So we are using Google Meet with this fixed address uh, for remote office hours, which will be on Tuesday uh, between 12 and 13.30, 1 30. Uh, There are exceptions. Again, you can click there. These are my travel dates. No travel in these days. Uh, but there are uh, remote activities or local activities that prevent me from being there. So before getting in contact, check that page uh, in my website, in my course website. Okay, so uh, I'll stop a moment and have access to the other one and check also if there are questions. Uh, okay, I can hear, I can hear. Oh, this is good. Well, very good. Uh, okay, so uh, we will use a textbook. So 
don't forget, you have slides, you have video, you have fast videos, uh, you have a copy of all the robotics video that I will show in the classroom, and even more. You have extra material, but you have to study on the book, okay? So the book is a main reference. It's a textbook uh, which is uh, internationally known, is uh, in English, but uh, there's also an Italian version, one-to-one, -one, and of course also Chinese, Greek version, and so on. It's a bestseller, and we have here in the room uh, one of uh, its co-author, Professor Oriolo, so uh, in this department. So uh, I will close, closely follow the notation in the book and the argument in the book, but of course with some changes, but it's not something which is orthogonal to what I'm presenting. So on the course web website, as I said, uh, you have the PDF of the lecture slides, and these are already uh, present. Uh, there will be update. For instance, yesterday I updated this presentation because I made some changes. So uh, download only uh, at the last minute if you wish, okay, if you want to have it on your computer. And then uh, zipped folders with the videos of each block of slides, so they have the same number. And then very important, you can find also written exams. Most of them contain a very detailed solution by myself, uh, more detailed than, I want, than what I would expect from you, but these are thought as uh, exercise, remote exercises for you. So uh, if you pick an exercise, try to solve it first, uh, once you have studied the material, and then look at the solution. And then other papers and extra documents, for instance, uh, the World Robotics Reports that is issued every year by the International Federation of Robotics. And of course, this is a big book and uh, there's only excerpts from that book. Uh, another very important thing, uh, in 2014-15, so before all what happened happened, uh, we recorded, uh, it was one of the first classes in our department and at the Sapienza University that was fully recorded in the classroom. So this is not uh, a massive open course, it's just like now, but there was a camera with a uh, two uh, technician here, so they recorded the full uh, course. And this is uh, on the video direct channel, in the playlist of Robotics One, uh, there are uh, 40 hours of lecture, and uh, as of end of September, more than 70,000 independent views, so different IPs that access the full video. So uh, from time to time, uh, I will ask you to go there and look at those videos, maybe parts that will not be covered because of the reduction of uh, the course now. And again, if you want to look back, uh, I change things from year to year, so this 2014-15, now it's six uh, years ago, so you may not find exactly the same things, but in any case, you will find on my website also the one-to-one -one PDF slide of this course, so the original that you find on those videos. And last but not least, we have a, a, a YouTube channel uh, of our robotics laboratory here at DIAG, and there you can find some of the video that I show in the classroom, but many more because these are, uh, collect all the research activity that our group uh, is doing since many years. So you're invited to visit also this part. So uh, what are the prerequisites for you? So you are a first year master student, so you have already a, a bachelor, uh, you may have different backgrounds, electrical engineering, computer science, mechanical engineering, and so on. So uh, this is quite difficult uh, to cover all things. So this is why I decided to make this course mostly self-contained. So you don't need to have any special prerequisites, but uh, I assume that you have some knowledge, elementary knowledge 
of few things. For instance, linear algebra. So you should be able to work with matrices, vectors, know what is uh, uh, an eigenvalue of a matrix, and things like that. Hmm? Something that you learn in calculus courses. Uh, kinematics in the sense, so if you have taken a physics one course, so this is the mechanics of the single point uh, moving in space or of a rigid body moving and changing orientation in space. But we will cover this again because we will see that uh, a robot manipulator can be seen as a chain of rigid bodies. We will call each body a link, like in our arm, connected by joints that where the actuators provide mobility. Like our muscles are moving the joints, and of course, when they, you're moving a joint, you're moving also whatever else is in the chain of bodies. So, uh, third elementary knowledge, if you have some background in automatic control, in particular, and the concept of feedback. Because we will see that uh, in order to execute correctly uh, a robotic task, we can plan the motion, uh, but to recover from disturbances and errors and mismatches, we need some feedback action. So we need to me measure the current state of the system and compare it to a desired evolution and then correct the nominal command using feedback. And this gives robustness in performance. So this is uh, embedded in the concept of feedback. Feedback is a, a scheme present in nature, in our bodies and, and beyond. Uh, so this is quite natural. You don't need to have uh, more than this information. If you have more, the best. Uh, so what are the goals? So at the end of this course, uh, you will have tools, mathematical tools, uh, in order to analyze uh, mainly serial robot manipulators. We will see what do I mean by serial. So robot manipulators, which are chains of uh, many rigid bodies. Most of the time we have six joints and six moving links. And this number is important because six is the number of degrees of freedom that you need to position and orient a body in the 3D space. So if you think of my arm as being a robotic arm, and I have a, an end effector, which is my hand, usually robots are equipped with grippers, so the gripper should grab something or hold a tool, and with the tool, you should do motion in space. We will see many examples. So I should be able to position my end effector in a point in the 3D space, and I need three degrees of freedom for doing that, and orient the end effector, for instance, for doing an insertion. Uh, and I need, in general, three more degrees of freedom. So this six is a magic number. Uh, and in fact, in order to independently uh, command these six quantities in the Cartesian space, uh, I don't have actuators on my fingers, let's say, uh, but I will use the actuators distributed on my arm, and in the same way a robot will use his actuator, which are typically mounted at the joints, but not necessarily, to move what happens in the Cartesian space. So uh, we will describe this motion in the two spaces. We will see how do we plan typical free motion tasks, so trajectory, uh, either in the Cartesian space or in the joint space where we have the actuation. And this is a basic issue, moving from one space to the other, when we are planning motion, and when we are trying to execute motion and controlling if everything is going well, also doing feedback. Okay, so we can do feedback from different spaces depending on our sensor and depending on our model. And of course, how do we program this motion? Uh, we will see uh, one example of a 
typical language for robot manipulators, but any language is the same. And it's not different from a generic language like Python or uh, C++ and so on. It has data structure, it has commands. There are specific things that characterize uh, languages for robots. Unfortunately, these languages are most of the time proprietary. So if you buy an Italian robot, let's say from the Comau brand, you will use the language, the uh, language of Comau. If you're buying a, a KUKA robot from Germany, you will use the KRL language and so on and so on. But all they look pretty much the same. There's no standardization, unfortunately. Uh, so programming, and then of course we will see um, some application in mostly in the industrial setting, but uh, also in the service domain. So outside the factory floor where uh, industrial robots are, were born in a sense. Okay, although our intuition, uh, science fiction and so on, think of robots outside the factory floor, like humanoids and things like that. But I will try to stick in this basic course, because we cannot do everything, uh, on fixed base manipulators. Uh, if you're interested in mobile manipulators, so that move in the environment, fly, go underwater, uh, on legs, on wheels, and so on, you have uh, the course of Professor Oriolo, which is uh, autonomous mobile robotics, okay? Of course, there are many, uh, common concepts, but essentially the basic difference is fixed base uh, with respect to uh, moving base. So these are uh, the other courses of interest. Of course, uh, we have the robotics too, uh, course that I'm teaching in the second semester, uh, where we will do some advanced stuff, including uh, several control design uh, and consideration of the dynamics of the robot manipulator. So uh, not just looking at the motion, describing the motion of these chains of rigid bodies, but also understanding the relation between the uh, generalized forces, the torques produced by the actuators and the acceleration of these bodies. And of course, this will depend on the masses and inertia uh, of the single uh, links of the robot manipulators and how we describe this and how can we do uh, a full dynamics model used for simulation purposes, but also for controlling in real time the motion in an accurate way. So this will be part of the robotics too. And, and for those uh, who are interested mainly in robotics, no matter if you have a background from control engineering or from artificial intelligence and robotics, so the two Acronym stand for Master Artificial Intelligence and Robotics in Rome, or Master of Con Control Engineering in Rome. Uh, you may choose this uh, course. Okay. So let me start, if I'm lucky, with the first video. This is a commercial video. So, of course, it will be, it will highlight. Uh, the good things about this robot, but this is a classical small size uh, industrial manipulator with six degrees of freedom. So while showing the motion, uh, look also at the mobility of the joints. There will be six joints of the Revolut type, which means that you are... Uh, Excuse me, sir. Yes? So is it possible to add other participants because there are some students waiting? Sorry, I didn't get you. Actually, there are some students waiting to be added. Kindly add them. Okay, can you write it in the, in the chat? Uh, okay, 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 sure, sure, sure. Because I, I cannot understand you.
Uh, okay. So uh, remember to keep your microphone off at home. Okay, I'm keeping my off here from the presentation side. Okay, I think we can go ahead. So, uh, so as I was saying, there are, you will see six revolute joints. Actually, you don't see the joints. You see the link in motion. But uh, a joint is revolute if it is able, through the actuation, to move the associated link. There's one actuator for each link. Uh, in rotation with respect to the previous in the chain. Okay, uh, we will see some a few characteristics. If I'm able, I will stop the video at some time. Uh, so let's look at how they present uh, their robot. So you see, there's a fixed base. Uh, this is mounted on the floor. Uh, there's an end effector with a flange where you can mount a tool, a gripper, or any other tool that you can use for doing a technological uh, task. So you see that uh, while moving the six joints, you can trace uh, very fun fancy trajectories, so geometric path with the timing law on them. Uh, you can also... I mean, they, they put emphasis on high performance in a reduced space with this small-sized robot. So you can do Cartesian motion like this. Uh, and now you can mimic the pick-and-place operation. Okay. Now this is fully in free space. So there's no contact with the environment, if not through a uh, potential uh, end effector gripper or whatever. So this uh, just highlight the design. It's, a, it's very compact. At the base, you have all connector for bringing power to the motors and communicating with a remote computer. And here you see a, a gripper, a three finger gripper mounted. So this is a, a simulation, of course. Uh, you can uh, uh, pick up object and bring them from one place to the other, which is a typical manipulation that it occurs in industry and not only. Now, uh, despite the small side, here you can see a very important uh, concept, the concept of workspace. So all the points that can be reached by the end effector while moving the joints in all possible way. And you have seen that there's a hole inside because the robot cannot bring its uh, end effector close to its base because of the joint limit and also to prevent self-collision. Uh, indeed, uh, the workspace is important because within the workspace you have to place all the things that the robot should work on, uh, moving things or uh, serving uh, computer-controlled machines uh, and so on. We will see many applications. Now, uh, the robot can work at different temperature. This is very an extended range between zero and 65 Celsius. And now this is very important. So you can mount the robot on the base, but in fact you can mount the base at any orientation. Uh, on the ceiling, on the, uh, uh, on the walls, and so on. And this allows to uh, put many robots together working on the same object. For instance, the car body for doing a welding operation. So that not only one robot is doing the task, but you have a, a, a cooperation. And of course, you have certification. Now, this is more on the, on the advantages of having a, a compact robot. And here you can see the teaching box through which you can program the robot. Of course, you can program robo the robot from a computer. But many times, uh, uh, let's say, a technician that should modify things use the teach box, uh, which is handheld and uh, can get closer to the robot itself, moves the single joints, move the end effector according to some linear motion, and record position. And then this will be the skeleton of a program, and then you can use this program in several settings. You can change parameters. You can decide how fast you want to go from one configuration to the other uh, along 
straight line in the Cartesian space or straight line in the joint space, if you can imagine what this means, and so on and so on. So this is the typical setting. And have you seen that uh, in, in this video, uh, we could uh, capture the need of having this agility, so moving the end effector in several ways, although uh, this is a wide room. Nothing happens around the, the robot. You will see that uh, much happens when these robots are placed on the factory floor and do operation, many types of operation. So uh, if we can extract from the specific application, we will be able to describe the motion of this robot, what the end effector is doing when we are commanding motion at the joint, uh, which configuration should the robot uh, assume if we want that the end effector is placed in a certain pose, so in a certain position and orientation, uh, and all this type of problem, and then how do we plan trajectory from one point to the other, how do we include a planning for the orientation of the end effector, which is kind of uh, more difficult. Huh? If there was no orientation in our 3D world, that would be a pity, but everything would, would be also much easier to describe, just in terms of position. Okay, so uh, let me add a few late summer. So, uh, I will uh, show farther videos. Uh, these are taken from uh, an educational site of KUKA. Uh, KUKA is the largest brand in Europe, together with ABB from Sweden. KUKA is from Germany. I don't have any preference, except for the fact that we have a KUKA lightweight robot, not this IVA, but the lightweight robot 4 plus in our lab, and they are quite advanced uh, robots. So we, I will use a few uh, uh, short clips in order to illustrate a number of things. For instance, how do we program uh, an elementary motion using the teach box? So uh, a human operator will carry this handheld object, there's a screen, there are a number of buttons, there's a space mouse uh, on, mounted on it, there's a, a safety button in case uh, the teach box falls and the robot is moving, because remember that safety first, so you should not be allowed to get closer to robots in general. Huh? So if they are moving, you're out. If you're in, they are not moving. And sometimes they are not even uh, uh, actuated in the sense uh, electricity is not on. Okay. So, uh, but pay attention that this class of robot, which is uh, the current generation, is completely different from the huge robot that you may find uh, in the industry. That have payloads of uh, hundreds of thousands of kilograms. And of course, they are very massive. Uh, this is a lightweight robot. Huh? So, LBR is the German acronym for uh, uh, Leichtbau Roboter. So, in, in, in English, is LWR, so lightweight robot. So, this robot weighs 14 kilograms as a whole. And it's also sensorized in a, uh, at the joint so that it can feel the touch. So it's one class of robot that is supposed to be safer, not safe in absolute term, but safer when a human is getting closer to it. So this is a, a new concept that is uh, coming uh, into practice, which is fundamental if we move the robot out of the factory floor. So if this robot is working at home, or in a different setting where you cannot put cages and limitation around the robot, uh, then you should make sure that the robot will not harm 
uh, any human operator or any other human that is uh, around. So if there is contact, the robot will stop. It's light enough not to uh, have uh, large energy uh, connected to the collision and so on. So this is why you will see the human uh, getting very close to the robot. So uh, the first uh, video concerns uh, teaching, so recording the motion, uh, recording three points, and then programming the motion between three points in the Cartesian space. How do we do this? Of course, we activate the motors, so you push the button. Uh, of course, the, the screen changes uh, command, like on smartphone, depending on the uh, context, okay? So it's not fixed. The buttons are there because, for instance, you want to move one joint at a time, so you press joint seven or joint, yes, this is seven revolute joints, so there are seven joints. The last joint is just the rotation of the flange. Uh, so you can do several things with this one. So let me start this video from here. So teaching position, uh, position in the Cartesian space. So you're moving, you see that you're moving all the joints at the same time, but with only one command, because what you're actually commanding is a Cartesian motion along linear path. And then you press a button and you store this position. Uh, then you move it down and you store, then you move it on the side and you store the second position. Actually, you store a position and orientation, but as you can see, uh, there's no change in orientation. The end effector is always remaining vertical pointing down. But this is, it's very easy to go where you would like to be just by uh, moving the robot with this command. Now you have stored things and you bring the robot to a home position. And now you have commanded that you move in linear Cartesian, along linear Cartesian path, keeping the orientation constant from one point to the other. And then you're back, okay? Now question, when the user is, uh, let, me, let me go back, maybe. I can stop it. Here. Okay, when we are in this situation, so we have point one, two, and three stored in the memory of the computer driving uh, this robot. What do you think it is stored? So if I have P1, how is P1 represented here? This is a question also for those back remotely. Okay, very good. So here, uh, somebody says uh, the angles, so the joint angles, okay? And in fact, this is what really happens because if I store the, this configuration, for instance, in point P3, uh, I forget about where X, Y, Z is this point in the Cartesian space. I just stored the individual joint angles of this seven revolute joint robot. And in order to come back to the same Cartesian position, I just need to bring each joint to this set value, okay? And there's a unique way for uh, getting there. Indeed, in this position P3, I could be also with other configurations, okay? If I don't care about the orientation, I can be like this, but I can be also like this, like this. There are infinite ways of being there, okay? So if I want to be sure to be in this configuration, I will store the configuration. And not, of course, this will be associated to this point in a unique way. And this is what we call direct kinematics. So when we know the joint, variable values, we can compute where the end effector is. It will be in point P3 and it will have some orientation. 
Now, in this case, it's vertical pointing down, but could be any. While the vice versa is not true, uh, here it's not true because we have seven joints. So we are more than the, those strictly needed to position and orient the end effector how we wish. So this is called a redundant, a kinematically redundant problem. Our arm is highly redundant, okay? Because of the degrees of freedom in the hand, but even if you froze the hand and you use only the arm, you can do this experiment, you can place your wrist somewhere with some orientation and keep your shoulder fixed. And now you have some internal motion at the end without changing the orientation and the position of the end effector and without changing the base. It means that you have at least one extra degree of freedom, like this. In fact, this is kind of anthropomorphic uh, in its design. Okay, so this is uh, one thing. There are other situations where, uh, now, despite you have uh, stored the configuration, you have seen that the actual motion that you program occurs in, in Cartesian space. I mean, of course, always in the Cartesian space, but it's a linear path, very clear in the Cartesian space. So if you store a configuration for point P1, a configuration for point P2, and a configuration for point P3, you may decide at the runtime or later on to go from one point to the other uh, with some prescription of the Cartesian motion, or if you don't care what you're doing at the end effector level, you can just join a, a linear motion in the joint space, which means that you join uh, a linear path for each joint from the initial value to the final value, from point one for, to point two, from point two to point three, and so on. Okay? And of course, what the end effector will do is, who knows? And who knows, because the geometry of this is highly nonlinear. Linear path in the joint space are not linear path in the Cartesian space and vice versa. Linear path in the Cartesian space are very strange motion in the joint space. Okay. So why you should plan motion in the joint space? Essentially because this is faster. And we will see that if you do this, you never encounter problem, uh, neither of joint limits, because of course you can check in advance if your motion is inside the maximum range that each joint can achieve. Uh, like my elbow, uh, I can flip it in this direction, but I cannot flip it in the other direction, okay? I can turn and do this, but I'm using other joints, okay? So same thing for uh, robots, you will have typically joint limitation. So if you plan in the joint space, you can take into account very easily. And, which is a similar problem, much more sophisticated. So I'm anticipating this now, but we will see all the details later on. Uh, we will uh, always avoid kinematic singularities. So singularities of a special matrix, which we will call Jacobian, which is the matrix which relates joint velocities to end effector linear and angular velocities. So if we are specifying a motion in the Cartesian space, like here, linear motion, then we have to convert the velocity that we would like to achieve into velocity in the joint space. And in doing this, we may hit some singularity. And the singularity is where the actual mobility of the robot is partly lost. It's a strange phenomenon, but uh, colloquially, we can say that if we are in a singular configuration, we cannot move the end effector with the desired speed in any direction. No? We have a subspace of direction that we can uh, realize and other that we cannot realize. While we, when we are out of a singularity and we have enough degrees of freedom, at least six, we can move in any uh, direction with any desired speed, uh, linear and angular, okay? So if you plan in the joint space, you get rid of this because you never invert the matrix which can be singular. No? This, is, this is why linear algebra is very important, okay? It comes directly into this physical problem. Okay, more question from remote? Let me see. 
Okay, okay, there are still. So let's move to the next one. So uh, now we do a, a further step. So we go outside the classical way of programming. Of course, you may wonder, but do we need an operator going close and moving around with the pitch loss? No, we don't need that. Now we can program the motion from our desktop. We have simulation programs that shows what would happen, and then we download the code, and this will be executed. But this possibility of uh, manual control or manual programming, if you wish, is always present. In the first generation robots in the uh, 70s, uh, 80s, and so on, this was the main way of programming this. Okay? Now you can use uh, many techniques and many simulations to know in advance what's going on. So, but, uh, okay, before, before looking at another way of programming motion, let's see what happens if we have programmed the motion, for instance, from one point, Cartesian point to another, keeping constant orientation. So it's like going on, on this table and moving from here to there, okay? But as you can anticipate here, the word is not what we expect. It's not a flat surface, but it's a bunchy one, okay? So what will happen? So the robot gets in contact, and now instead of having free motion on the surface, it will encounter this. So will it crash uh, the environment or the end effector will be damaged? So this depends on how the robot controller complies with this uncertainty. And uh, in this and in many other robots, you can design the stiffness of the robot with respect to the actual environment. So it's like saying, I, I want to do a motion in free space and somebody is pushing me away. Now, I can be very stiff, so you push, but I keep my motion. Or I can be very sloppy and I go away. Now, if you are too sloppy here, you will lose contact. While supposedly you had to uh, be there and probably apply also some contact forces. Remember, we will see most of the time free motion tasks, but many tasks in industry involve a contact, a continuous contact, not just a contact for picking a, an object and placing it somewhere else, but with the tools, you have to uh, debar a uh, mechanical surface or polish it. So you have to apply forces in order to do this. Otherwise, uh, this cannot be done. So if the environment is infinitely stiff, so it's a geometric, a pure geometric environment in, uh, in our mind, in our model, uh, then of course you can touch it without applying force, or you can touch it so you follow the same path, but you're applying force. So this is an extra possibility that you have when you are in contact, okay? So with this in mind, now this video shows how you can comply, how can you regulate the compliance of the robot, so in particular in the Cartesian space, in order to react properly to uh, this uh, uneven surface. So keeping contact, but not destroying it, okay? So uh, let's see if I can, yeah, next slide. So you get some flexibility in the sense you have not to reprogram things. So you have programmed this linear path in the Cartesian in contact. Huh? It's a flat surface. And you are very accurate. Now you place something in between, you go down, and if you can see, you can follow the nominal path, accommodating to the difference in, 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 uh, in position, because you have given some compliance. And this can be programmed. Of course, the stiffer I am, the more force will I apply, trying to reach the desired position on the flat surface, which I will probably never reach, okay? Or something very 
critical may happen in between. So I'm crashing the tool or I'm crashing the object. If I'm, if I'm following the, the surface of an egg, I cannot push too much, okay? And in fact, robots uh, have been built and controlled in such a way that you can do very tiny force control while in contact with uh, delicate objects, okay? So this is a, a first concept. So we can include some compliance uh, at the programming level. And we can uh, do this in a more sophisticated way. So we can generate uh, different behavior in response to any contact force, not only at the end effect level, but also forces applied to the structure. So I'm pushing the robot. And this is a brand new. Of course, you cannot push a robot which is huge, which is uh, uh, one ton or whatever. Uh, you're not allowed to do that, by the way. This can be done only for this collaborative type of robot. Okay. Now, in the first video, uh, maybe you can, I, I will, I will, So there are three axes in green, blue, and, and red. And on each axis, there is some program stiffness. So we have on the blue axis, the vertical axis, there are 100 Newton per meter. What does it mean this? That if you give a position and you have a force that brings you away from that position along the blue direction, the robot will react trying to recover that position with 100 Newtons per meter. So if you displace by one meter, you will apply 100 Newton, which is a huge force, okay? So it's, it's expressed in per meters, but in fact, you handle centimeters of displacement, okay? Now, on the Y horizontal axis, we have 300 Newton meter. So the robot is stiffer. Remember, stiffness is the inverse of compliance. If I'm compliant, I have a low stiffness. If I'm very stiff, I have a low compliance, okay? And finally, along the red axis, which is coming outside the screen, uh, I have 2,000, I guess, 2,000 Newton meters. So I have selective compliance in the various directions. Now the operator will move the, uh, the end effector, and you will see what is the reaction of the robot in the various states? So this is a programmable compliance just for position. So if I'm pushing in this direction, this is relatively soft. And it recovers also the original position. Okay. Now this is 100 Newton meters, Newton per meter, sorry. Okay, this was just a uh, preliminary. Now, okay, you see that if you try to bring it closer to you, you cannot really move the robot. Uh, on the green axis, there is more motion in response to the same amount of force. Okay. And finally, in the vertical direction, you have almost, I mean, largely compliant behavior. Okay. So you may think, why do I need this? Even if I don't have a human pushing on that, this will be the typical way of reacting to position error at the end of at the end effector level. So this is a control problem, okay? So you're not, you're not programming emotion, you're programming how do you react to any force. And the force is due to the fact that the end effector with its tool probably is interacting with the environment. Uh, if everything is perfect, nominal, so the parts are placed where I expect, the shape of the parts are what I expect, the robot, I know where the robot is, everything is precise, I don't need any sensor. Because it's everything is planned and how I plan it, I will do it. But unfortunately, the world is full of uh, non-idealities, friction, uh, error in position, error in the sensor, whatever. So I need feedback in order to be robust. Okay. And in the
So far, we have seen compliance along linear directions. Can we do the same for angular motion? For instance, can we be very stiff if we try to change the orientation and very soft if we try to move it linearly or vice versa? I cannot move it linearly, but uh, I can change with a small amount of force applied uh, the orientation of the object. And this is what happens in this second video. So these are examples of program compliance. So you see that uh, you can move it linearly, but you cannot change orientation. Huh? Uh, the first attempt was so the, the end effector is not changing orientation because of a high stiffness. And now you change, reverse the situation. The tip is not moving, but you can change the orientation of the tip of the end effector of this robot by having uh, reversed the values of the uh, compliance, okay? So again, high stiffness in the linear component will not move uh, we, we, we will be such that if you apply a force in the linear direction, the tip will not move. But if you have low compliance on the angular quantity, which characterizes the orientation of the tip, if you push, you will move around. Uh, and of course, you can be compliant in both directions. If you push, it changes position and orientation. Visual representation. You can use this for programming the robot, but apart from the presence of a human that touches the robot, this is important every time the robot will uh, move, both in contact and both in free space. Because if I have a, a free space motion and for any reason, there's a disturbance that brings me away from the desired path, so that the end effector is not on the path, on the planet path, neither in position nor in orientation, then the way in which you recover this error depends on this compliance gains, okay? And you can plan this gain in the Cartesian space, as it, we have seen here, but also in the joint space. So how do you react to errors in the joint space if you have decided to plan your trajectory in that space, okay? So this is a very general concept which is illustrated by physical interaction, which is feasible and safe because of the, uh, So, uh, as I said, this idea allows to do physical, I mean, safe physical human-robot interaction and use this to program the motion. So not with the teach box going from one point to the other, but just moving around things. It seems worse, but in fact, it's more natural. It's certainly more natural. If you think of a, a small or medium enterprise where you don't have a bunch of research and development people that do the implementation of robotic solutions, but you have few people, some technician, uh, you have bought one, two robots for doing tasks in an autom automatic way, so this is a major advantage that you can program things, but also correct it you know, by hand saying, oh, this should be more tilted to the left, to the side. You use your human experience in order to uh, improve the time you need for correct programming of the motion. So the idea here is developed in, in, in two, let me see if this starts, yeah, uh, in two uh, phases. First, the sketch, huh? 
So we have a human, we have a robot. The robot moves around and then records its position you know, and do the whole task that the robot should do by just uh, hand guiding, let's say, the robot and possibly changing also its uh, joint configuration and not only the end effector position and orientation. And now the robot will, at runtime, repeat exactly what he learned, quote unquote, because he didn't learn much. I mean, it was just playing back what was. So if I, the robot needs to do something new, you know, it should start from scratch again. Okay. So this was the idea, and because of the technology involved here, so lightweight robot and presence of, uh, we'll see this is important, although you can get rid of this, but this is a more advanced. At each joint, you know, there are joint torque sensors. So sensors that can measure uh, the force or the torque around the joint axis. So when you're pushing the robot, in fact, this is being measured by the internal sensor. And it's like if I'm pushing my arm here and I want to resist. So I'm in a, in a static situation. So I'm pushing, but my arm is forcing back so that I can stay static. So my muscles, so my joints feel something. Uh, and of course, my muscle apply forces, but here I have sensor at the joints that can feel how much force do I need to stay in this situation. And we will see that the same matrix that relates the joint velocities to the end effector velocity, if you transpose this matrix, this will be the matrix that relates the applied forces at any point at the end effector, for instance, to the torques that you need to apply at the joint in order to be in a static equilibrium. Okay, very nice dual duality and from a linear algebra point of view. The transpose of a matrix does the reverse, but on forces, not on velocity, okay? So here, uh, the second video shows the industrial solution. And now you see that there is something more than just a sketch. For instance, you have to uh, have a, an end effector, for instance, here, where you press the button, the green light, comes and then you can move freely or record a configuration. So here it's a very nice pick and place operation. So you start from a point P1, then you bring the robot close to the point, desired point, then uh, you do the uh, pick operation, closing the gripper in point three, you bring it to a, a via point P4, you go around the obstacle, okay? And then you get closer, this is an approach position, P5, and then the insertion position, P6. And of course, you press the button in order to store the configuration. So there's something more in order to uh, command just without moving hands, just holding the robot the whole path. And now you put the, the object back to the initial position, the starts from the home position, goes to point one, stops, point two, and point two, an approach point, okay, in order to come on the top of the object. Then there's a via point in order to avoid the collision with the obstacle. And then again, approach point P5 and insertion in P6. So this is peg in a hole. I mean, robots do not do this peg in a hole, but do a lot of assembly. And in fact, if you're able to program this elementary task, then you can program much more complex assembly, if you wish. Okay. So, uh, and if you're, uh, if you like this video, uh, I mean, these are already uh, a couple of years old. So, uh, at the, this YouTube channel of, uh, educational channel of PUCA, you can find new one, and probably not this one, eh? but new one and interesting as well. Okay, let me stop for a, a moment here and Okay, there's a question by Shayan Amadi. Says, is orientation set based on end effector primary position? So if I understand correctly the question, says, if I'm in a given position with the end effector, this is 
related uniquely to the orientation? In general, no. So if I have enough joints, I can be in a certain position, and then I can change the orientation. Or I can keep the same orientation and move the position. So these are independent quantities. Of course, if I have a reduced number of degrees of freedom, and we will see this, for instance, for the class of robots, very common, the SCARA type, which have only four degrees of freedom, well, there are some orientations that cannot be achieved. So that part of the orientation is fixed, no matter which position you have. Okay. But in general, these are uh, two independent things. And if you don't care about orientation, pay attention. So if your task only says you have to follow this path no matter which orientation you take, so following a path in the 3D space requires being able to assign an X, Y, Z coordinate, the end effector, over time. And if you have six joints, you can do this in many ways. So your robot, although it has six degrees of freedom, becomes redundant for this task. So the concept of redundancy is uh, related to the task that you have to do. So the same robot can be redundant for a task or not, or maybe cannot have enough degrees of freedom to do the task. So you have all possibilities. Okay, We will see in robotics too, because uh, this is a, has been and is currently still a, a research area, how do you use at best redundancy when you have some? Okay. So here I'm just highlighting a few things in the Robotics 1 course about uh, this possibility. I don't know if I answer to your question. Eh? If you're able to say, okay, I will be happy. Tagliate mani. Okay, fine, good. Thanks. So uh, let's go back here and move on. So now let's go back to uh, less interesting thing. What is the program? So we will go uh, jumping around across uh, different things. So in my introduction, I will talk about mainly manipulator arms, so arms, fixed base, no legs, no wheels, although many robots are moving around, okay? Uh, so now and then you will see in the videos uh, a few mobile-based robots as well. And uh, we will go through industrial application. I will uh, highlight in one of the next lectures uh, the many things that a robot can do, really in a cell, together with other robots, together with other machines, in very crowded environments where you save space because of money, and so you have to program not only the motion of one robot, but a coordinated motion of all robots. So these robots will never interact physically with each other, but they are working on the same object, and they should be coordinated as well. So it's a weak collaboration. Huh? We talk about strong collaboration, for instance, with our two arms when we hold an object together and we carry it over. Then this is collaboration because we exchange forces through the object. While if I'm doing something here, I'm doing something there, I just have to present, prevent collisions. So it's a collaborative or coordinated, but the collaboration is low mm, in terms of no force. So uh, we will see many industrial applications. Uh, I will say something more on, on service application. There are many, there are many service robotics and many more. Mm. So I will come back to this later and I'm anticipating, I will skip this part and I will give you a homework on that. Uh, then we will do some anatomy. Okay. Now, in order not to be tedious, uh, we will do this not in this uh, exact uh, sequence, but of course we will talk about mechanical structure, what type of joints are there, uh, how, they, how the links are arranged, what is the kinematic structure more, more common for industrial robots. And then we will talk about actuators because we need to move things. Huh? Robotics is about motion. Although you see static slide, uh, there's only motion involved. 
and of course how these motors, typically electrical motors, but not only, through transmission will move the joints of the robot. So in the, in the first place, you can imagine that if I have to move my elbow, I need a motor face here, okay? But suppose that I don't want to move the elbow and I want to move my arm. Doing around like this. So I'm carrying these heavy motors because motors are the heaviest part, especially in these collaborative robots, uh, without advantage. If I'm able to place the motor here and then have transmission that brings the motion at the joints where I need and the transmission are lighter in general, then I have a, a, a dynamic advantage. I'm moving less mass with the same amount of torque, so I can accelerate more. Robots should be fast and accurate, okay? So transmission are very important. Of course, it's a mechanical design. We will not go into the design of this, but just for your understanding of the anatomy, if you open a robot, what you will find inside, okay? And sensor, sensor are very important. Uh, blind robots, blind in the sense not only vision, but without sensors are not so useful because it will mean that in order to properly work, everything else should be arranged in a perfect way. So if you think to buy a robot to do uh, automatic some task, you will spend at least twice the cost of the robot in order to arrange the situation. So the flexibility that you gain with the robot is lost by the fact that you have to structure your environment. In order to reduce the structuring of the environment, you need sensor. And sensor, uh, there are two main classes. Uh, th this is a bio-inspired classification. Proprioceptive, so sensor that provide information on the internal state of the robot. And typically these are those that gives you information about the angle of its joint, typically encoder, sometimes less and less nowadays. There are also sensors that measure directly the velocities, so tachometers mounted on the motors, and through the transmission, this information can be mapped into the uh, measure of the joint velocity. Okay, most of the time you take a joint position measurement by optical encoder, and you do numerical differentiation because you're commanding in discrete time yeah, through, through the sampling time in your controller. So uh, you can do a simple difference between two positions divided by the interval of time and you have an estimate of the velocity. Much better things can be done anyway, but just to have an idea. So uh, if you have joint torque sensors mounted at the joints, even if it's not listed here, this is also a proprioceptive sensor because it measures the internal state of force at the joint due to the contact, but also due to the fact that the motor are transmitting torques to the link in order to accelerate, okay? So you can have a sensor that measures how much torque is passing through the transmission. And we'll see uh, these things, but fundamentals in this, so all the robots comes equipped at least with joint encoder. Now this is the minimum equipment that they have. And then there are a huge number of possible extraceptive sensors, which are sensors that give information of the interaction or of the environment around the robot. So in contact or uh, in proximity or at the distance. And here there are many more. So uh, we will say something about force torque sensor, which are cylinders mounted on the final flange. You have seen in the first video, the final flange is rotating and there are holes. You can mount on it uh, these cylinders which measure uh, three component of forces and three component of moments around three axes which are attached to the sensor itself. So you can measure six quantities. So, uh, and this is important if you interact with the environment and you want to know what, what type of force you are uh, applying. There are tactile sensors, for instance, even in simple gripper, you may have a tactile sensor to understand if you have taken something in between. 
or you command just a closing of the gripper. By the way, opening and closing a simple gripper is not a degrees of freedom for the robot because the gripper may not be there. So you count it separately. So if you just, if you don't know if the, this object is like this or like this, you just command closure. So if there's no object, you will close and you will detect when you close because if you have two touch sensor here, but then if you do this, you will stop at this moment or even before if you are, so this gives flexibility. Okay, adaptability to different operating situations. So tactile sensor are important, especially in the grippers. And then everything which is uh, around the robot, and these are of paramount importance for mobile robots moving in, a, in an environment, but also for fixed base robot, uh, you may need to know what is in the close proximity. So you have ultrasound sensor, uh, infrared, uh, laser, laser scanner, and of course vision. Vision-based control is now nowadays very important. Okay, so we'll see the basics, how this sensor works. I cannot go into detail. You could do a whole course on sensors, okay? So uh, I will highlight what is important for a robot. For instance, talking about vision, uh, computer vision has made enormous progresses, you know, machine learning techniques are the state of the art right now, and you can recognize many things, but, 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 you don't need to be so fancy with robots, and most of the time, you need real-time performance. So you need to be able to extract from what you see some uh, reduced amount of information, but since you have to command the motion while you're looking at things, so you have milliseconds to do your operation. So real-time vision is important for robotics. Although you can do much better things, recognize textures, recognize objects, single out faces uh, and so on. Uh, the limitation here, uh, if you can do this in milliseconds, fine, but in fact, you can have a simple working solution that requires less information, but provides to the controller the right information in uh, real time, okay? And of course, same for the other, the, the other sensor, but this is less critical. Now, uh, the bulk uh, of the course is really on, on this part. Why is that? Although I'm trying to motivate you uh, through example, through application, but this is the common knowledge that every student or researcher or engineer in robotics should have. So how do you describe position and orientation? Position is easy. We will see that for describing orientation, we have many alternatives. We have pros and cons. So for instance, we will talk about minimal representation of orientation through Euler angles or global representation through rotation matrices and things like that. Then direct and inverse kinematic. So as I suggested with, through the example, we command the motion in the joint space where the actuator is. But we look at the performance at the Cartesian level. So we need to know if I'm in a joint configuration, where is my end effect? And this is the direct kinematic. It's a unique solution problem. If you set up the notation, and we will use the denavit hartenberg notation, this is quite easy. You will be an expert in denavit hartenberg transformation matrices uh, in a few weeks from now. And inverse kinematics, exactly the opposite. If I would like to take an object and I know where the object is in the Cartesian space, why I know where it is? Because I have a camera that looks at this and commands through transformation and says, uh, look, in your reference frame, at the base of the robot, the object is there. So where should I go? I cannot command the motion in the Cartesian space right away, uh, unless I have the model that, I'm, uh, that we will derive here. So I need to know what is the configuration. One is one configuration. I could have multiple configuration that puts the end effector there. And this is the inverse kinematic problem. Now, while the direct kinematic problem is simple, 
requires product of transformation matrix. Mm -hmm. So it has a unique solution. So inverse kinematics is a nonlinear problem. It may have no solution. For instance, if I'm saying with my arm, I should touch the, uh, I don't know, the light above, I, I cannot reach that. It's out of my workspace. How do I recognize that it's out of my work? Just from the data, okay? So, no solution. Or one solution, or multiple solutions. For instance, if I have to do this, uh, carry this, I can be like this, but I can also be like this. Now, this is my right arm, this is my left arm. I don't know what you see at home, but you know, if, if it's mirrored or not. But of course, it's the same arm. If I'm stretching my arm, I'm now coming back, and when I'm coming back, I have left arm configuration with respect to right arm configuration. And I have, in fact, two solutions, even if I have only two joints, huh? the shoulder and, and the elbow. Okay, so I can have multiple solutions, infinite number, or an infinite number of solutions if I'm in a singularity. Okay, or if I have redundancy. So this tells you that there's no way of uh, having a straightforward solution to the inverse kinematics. Uh, sometimes we have a closed form solution, so we can work out formulas that provides all possible solution, in this case, a finite number. You cannot have a function that generates from one data an infinite set of solutions, okay? So when we have uh, no redundancy, we may have solution in closed form, which requires some elaboration. And if we cannot find such solution, we will rely on numerical method. So we will solve set of nonlinear equation. And there are Newton methods, gradient methods, and so on, which in the context of robotics, use the Jacobian of the robot, so the same matrix that maps velocities in a proper way, okay? So this will be very important. And now, this is geometry. Now, there's motion, so differential motion, differential relationship. What happens if I'm in a given configuration and I'm giving a motion to one joint, what happens to the velocity of the end effect? And what if I'm moving another joint? something else. And what if I'm moving both joints, something else again? And if I'm giving the same velocity when I'm like this, let's say stretched, or when I'm folded, I'm giving the same velocity to my shoulder. Will I get the same velocity at the end of factor? No. So this is configuration dependent. Uh, it's related to the fact that the kinematic mapping is nonlinear. So it's differential is still nonlinear. It's configuration dependent. So we'll see, of course, the direct differential kinematics. I'm giving joints velocity in a given configuration and I see what happens to the end effector. Then I move, I change configuration. I have a new configuration, a new commanded joint velocity. What happens to the end effector velocity, okay? And inverse differential. So I'm in a given configuration. So I know where I am at the end effector level. I would like to go in one direction with some speed. So what is the velocity that I have to command to the joint? And I'm doing this at the velocity level, but I can do this at the acceleration level, at the jerk level, at the third derivative level, if I want to achieve very smooth motion. So I, if I assume that I can have this continuous acceleration, it's something. If I don't want this continuity, because this would maybe generate vibration in the mechanical structure, then I can move up one differential level and command jerk, so third derivative, and then see how do I invert it. We will see that again, the Jacobian will play a major role at any level, at any differential. Okay, so the Jacobian, uh, which you can define, well, this is too detailed now, uh, plays a, a major role. And then we will see that again, it plays a role also in the static transformation of force. As we said, uh, if I'm applying a force at the end effector and I want to resist it, what is the torque that I have applied to apply with the motors at the joint level in order to stay in that configuration? And then robot singularity. So what are the uh, strange situation where I lose, where the robot lose mobility in some direction 
and the transformation of forces has some peculiarities, and this depends on the singularities of the Jacobian involved. Okay? So this is uh, a core part. Now, after that, we will talk about planning trajectories, and there's a fundamental concept. Uh, we will see that for us, a trajectory is in fact the composition of two entities. A geometric path, typically parameterized by a parameter. So I want to go from one point to the other, and I have a parameter that says where I am are among this, in this step, from zero to one, whatever. There's no time involved in this. And now I'm saying, what is the timing law on this path? So, do I want to go very fast, or do I want to go there, stop, and then restart, or eventually go there, go back, and then so on? So, the timing law associated to a geometric path generates a trajectory. So, evolution in time. No? So, many times we will decompose the trajectory in the, its geometric path and its timing law. And the reason is that I can program a geometric path motion very slowly, for instance, with the teach bot, and then execute it at fast speed, okay? So that I don't need to be close when the robot is going very fast, okay? So I can scale the uh, timing of a given geometric path. This is a very important concept. And then we can do this in the joint space or in the Cartesian space, and many times I will use also this uh, terminology, task space. Many times is the Cartesian space of the end effector, but sometimes you can define task to be done by the robot in a very mixed way. For instance, I can plan a motion for my end effector while keeping my elbow in the Cartesian space below. Or I can do the same thing by moving the elbow. So I'm assigning also some trajectory to a different object. So I define all this as a task, and then I can plan trajectory for the task at hand for the robot. Uh, and then finally, we will talk about motion control. So no interaction, in fact, uh, if not in static condition. So we'll see what are the control system architectures. So how do we put together sensors, actuators, uh, commands, uh, reasoning about data, and so on. Uh, and we will present mainly kinematic control law, so using only kinematics, assuming, assuming that we are able to command at the end joint velocities or joint acceleration. Uh, so although these are bodies with masses and inertia. So in order to move them, I have to generate some force. So in fact, the actuators and motors produce on excesses some maximum torque. So how can we command velocity if we have motors that generate torque? In fact, we assume at this level that at each joint, for each actuator, there's a local control loop that receives reference velocity and applies the right torque in order to produce this velocity locally to the joint, okay? And in an ideal fashion, if the local controller is planned well, and if we are not requesting velocities that jump wildly with large acceleration, we are able to follow the planned trajectory. Unless some major event, some major disturbance occur, and then we have to react by feedback, okay? But in most of this robotics one course, we will assume that the commands are joint velocities. Okay, there are some limitation in this. In the robotics two course, we will move to the dynamics, so all control laws will directly generate a torque, which is the torque that the motor should produce in order to execute a given trajectory. So taking into account the fact that the robot has its own mass, inertia, and so on, while at the kinematic level, we treat the motion of my arm or a motion of the same geometry with 150 kilograms per each link exactly in the same way. 
it gives exactly the same speed. Of course, the motors will generate, will have to generate much larger torques if the arm is massive. But this is transparent for us. Of course, if we are requiring to the 150 kilogram links uh, an acceleration which is huge, my actuator may go in saturation and may not be able to do, uh, to provide the command, the, the needed torque. Okay, so we have some limitation to keep into account, but at this stage, we can safely assume that we can command uh, kinematic quantities to the joint, okay? And then see what happens at the end of factor level. And finally, uh, we will see some programming languages, in particular, one programming language is the KRL for the KUKA. And very important, I strongly that you use your favorite programming tool, it may be MATLAB with Simulink, it may be Python, it may be C++, but every single mathematical concept that we will talk about can be programmed. And you can check uh, results, what happens. And only if you program by yourself something, you will realize some subtleties in the, uh, in the treatment. Okay, it's not, most of the time is straightforward, but then you realize that there are some input data that will fail if you're not taking into account all the possibilities that may, may happen, or something like that. And if you want to uh, visualize things, you can use the robotics toolbox MATLAB, which is free. You remember that this, uh, for all students of Sapienza, is uh, all the toolbox of MATLAB are uh, free and you can uh, use it on your computer, not even be, being connected to it. Okay, once you have done this. So you can use the robotics toolbox by Peter Kort, which gives a lot of things. Uh, again, it's a convenient tool, but you have to understand what you're doing. You, you can call the basic commands, but then this is not the purpose. Just for, and, and the robotics toolbox has some skeleton representation of robots so that you can see more or less in 3D what happens. If you want a better representation, you can use DREP. DREP now has become a, a strange name. It's Coppelia Sim by the Coppelia uh, company. And the educational uh, version, which does most of what you need to do, has a lot of models pre-built, is free. Okay, so you can use this and uh, animate for instance, you can do a simulation in, in Simulink MATLAB, and the results, so the evolution of the joint over time, uh, you can pass this to a DREP program and then animate, let's say, a, a KUKA lightweight robot. So you have a, a nice representation of what's going on, okay, if you wish. But no matter what, I strongly suggest to uh, use programming tools. Now, many times students ask, uh, is this going to be in an exam? As if, if it's not in the exam, I don't care. You know, this is the wrong attitude. You, know? you have to learn something and you have to practice. Now here, I have put an if feasible. Uh, in the past years, uh, we arranged to do some demos in the lab. So in groups, uh, moving to the labs and, and, and making some demos live. And so you can pose question and then have a, almost a, a hands-on activity. Now, because of the situation, this is not feasible right now, and it won't be feasible before uh, the end of the course. So I'm trying to organize some virtual demos in the sense that you will be connected to Zoom uh, in the lab, and you may ask to do something. Uh, you will be shown some uh, experiments and so on. Okay, so it's a bit more than videos because things may be changed uh, in real time. Okay, in videos you have nothing much better to record. Okay, let, let me see if there are. Okay. So, uh, there's another question by Puriya Mohammadi that says, how the robot frames are set when learning human movements? Because there are a lot of joint collaboration for only one robot movement. 
I mean, joint movements are not unique. Well, uh, it's hard to completely understand the question because the concept of frame is very important. You will see that frames are everywhere. There are, there's a frame, so a reference frame placed at the base of the robot. There is one frame for each link. There's a frame placed at the end of sector. There's a frame which relates to the tool center point of the mounted tools and so on, and the transformation between frames is important. Now, what uh, your colleague um, saying, asking is, if I'm touching the robot in different ways, uh, I have a unique motion related. So I can push my forearm or push my arm and get the same motion. Of course, this is true. Okay. So uh, there's no basic frame. I mean, all the things that is felt in those videos is the resulting joint torques at the joint through this joint torque sensor. And then through this, you command motion to the joint. And of course, the resulting motion may occur by different set of forces applied at different points of the parts of the robot. Okay. There's not a unique way of, but you don't need special frames in, in that context. Okay, so uh, let me uh, complete this with some uh, organizational stuff. So how is the exam organized? Uh, so we will do a midterm test at some point, a remote midterm test, like the exams that you have done in the, uh, if you have done exam at Sapienza in the last semester, and then there will be a written exam. Uh, in person or not. Uh, and if you have done well to the remote midterm test, you can use this to eliminate part of the final written exam. If you are not satisfied with your performance, you just forget about that and you do the full exam at the end, okay? In very rare events, I do a, an oral part. So if I'm not sure about your preparation, I may ask you something about this full program. The exams, as you can see, I invite you to look at the exams right now. We may look at some of them while doing exercises, but just start looking at them. You will see that we, we, I cover all possible parts. There's no part which is not covered. Of course, there are parts more colloquial, more descriptive, but even then I will ask questions and, and do simple, uh, exercises on, on, for instance, on sensors, okay? Uh, but most of the things are on trajectory planning, on uh, kinematics analysis, assignment of frames according to Benavit Artenberg, inverse kinematics, and so on and so on, and for many different ways, uh, for many different uh, robots. So, uh, indeed, uh, this is the schedule. Uh, there are not fixed uh, dates yet. Uh, only intervals, so there are two sessions in Feb January and February, two sessions in between May and end of May and July, so June and July, and one session in September. And uh, very soon uh, you will see this on InfoStud, and if you don't want to go into InfoStud and check every time, you can check regularly the course website where all updates of materials are coming and also when this uh, dates are being published in InfoStud, you will find them also on my, on the course website. There are two more extra sessions, as you know, but these are not for you because you are in the first year of your master, if you are in the first year. And this is only for those who are in the following years or uh, more than two years of study. Uh, you sign up to the exam on InfoStud, of course, and if you uh, are interested later on and do a master thesis in robotics, then you can go to the lab website, not the YouTube site, but in the lab website, and you look for master thesis, and you have a whole bunch of samples. And some of these topics have been assigned in the past, some are still going on, but just to have an idea of what type of uh, master thesis you can have, and they can be performed uh, more theoretical, so 
independently. They can be performed in the lab. They can be performed in companies. Uh, in our European partners, we have many partners in uh, some European research groups. So there are many possibilities of uh, doing the piece. Okay, uh, I think, uh, so I will end up uh, in a few more minutes with uh, a few videos from uh, the robotics lab. So here you see uh, one robot, which is a KUKA KR5. It's not the Agilus, but it has the same size. It's a former model, it's the KR5, although the other one is called KR4, but it's later. So six degrees of freedom. And uh, you can recognize there's a rotation of the base. There's a rotation around the horizontal axis of the shoulder. There's a rotation here at the elbow. And then the last three rotations uh, are less intuitive. So you see this, this uh, segment there. That means that you have a rotation like this. Okay, so the upper part with respect to the lower part does this. And then you will have uh, a wrist rotation and finally a rotation of the spinal spine. And if you look carefully, there's a one axis of rotation. So joint four has this axis, which is now vertical. But of course, if I'm moving the other joints, this axis will move accordingly. But it points always in that direction and intersect joint five axis, the wrist, always, no matter where you are. Okay, and then the final rotation, again, it's an axis which changes, but always intersect uh, the previous two axes. So this is a robot which has a spherical wrist. So spherical, it's, uh, there are three joints, each joint gives one degree of freedom, but since the intersection is always in the same point, the center of the wrist, it's like having a spherical uh, joint. Okay, like you have, for instance, at the hip or at the shoulder, okay? And this is very important also for solving the inverse kinematics and computing things. So here you see, uh, you will see a motion here uh, repeated. So uh, you see that almost all joints are moving. There's a tool mounted on the, on the flanges to show better. And this tool is used to mount a camera uh, with an offset. Now questions, what do you think? Is this a, a motion commanded in the joint plan, a trajectory planned in the joint space or in the testicle? Uh, if somebody at home want, would like to answer, please do so. So remember, the motion is always commanded in the joint space because there is where the actuators the trajectory that the robot is doing. I tell you, there's a linear part. Is this in the joint space or in the testicle? Joint space. Who, who agrees with your colleague? Anybody? Come on. Why joint? I don't know, who, who says joint? Oh, you say joint. Well, first of all, it's very hard to, uh, to, to, to see a joint, a linear joint motion, eh? to, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. But you can see that this is, uh, I mean, rotating. So this is, this is a good idea. If you see that one joint is rotating, only one joint, then it's clear that this motion is planned in the joint space. Okay. But it's rotating, but the, the rest of our arm is retracting and then coming back. And in fact, this is a motion. If you look at the center, this point, this point goes along a straight line. And since it starts like this, to go in a straight line, I should do something like this. Okay, so this is a Cartesian motion with a linear path for position and with a linear motion of the Euler angles that represent the orientation uh, for deciding the, from the initial orientation to the final orientation. Here, uh, you see uh, the lightweight L LDR4 plus. So this is, uh, again, about 14 kilograms. 
uh, and it's a completely different technology than this one. Just to mention, this is uh, about 35 kilograms of moving parts, uh, apart from what is listed over here. And the payload, so the maximum weight that can be carried without compromising about accuracy is around four kilograms, one tenth. This robot can carry its own weight as payload, so one to one. So it's human life. Huh? So I don't know if you can guess what is the weight of your arm, but certainly you can carry that weight huh, with your hand. Okay. And here you see this is a, a, an exper a long experiment where we are acquiring data from. So we are exploring all possible configuration, and we are recording data in order to get a dynamic model. This is something that we will see in robotics too. But essentially to give an idea of the mobility, and here there are seven degrees of freedom, and it's a very nice uh, design because the first three joints, so the base joint rotation here, uh, the shoulder, and this joint here, which is making this type of motion, intersects here. Uh, let, let, me, let me show it again in motion. Okay, so intersects at a point here, which is the uh, spherical shoulder of the arm. So the first three axes intersect always in a point, which is somewhere here. Then uh, we have another axis here, uh, which is the elbow, which is independent. And then we have uh, one axis here uh, around this flange, so this part is rotating with respect to this one, and then two other joints there, and this last three intersect at the center of the spherical wrist. So we have a spherical shoulder, a spherical wrist, so three joints here, three joints there, and then an elbow in between. So the seven degrees of freedom, in fact, we will see that in the kinematic model, we need only two numbers to describe this mobility. So the orientation of the end effector, position and orientation of the end effector is a function, of course, of the seven joints, but uses only two geometric parameters, which are the distance between the center of the shoulder and uh, this part, and, uh, sorry, and the uh, elbow joint, and between the elbow joint and the center of the wrist. So two numbers, 41 centimeters and 40 centimeters are these two values. And so it's a very neat design besides other things. And uh, well, we don't have time to see this. So this is the third robot that we have in the, uh, currently in the, uh, in the lab. It's a universal robot, it's an industrial lightweight, 10 kilograms of payload, so this is why there are also UR3 and UR5 size, so three kilogram of payload and five kilogram of payload, uh, but we will see what is, this is doing later on. So uh, we will stop here, so let me, let me close this, uh, and uh, please comply with me in the sense that next Friday there will be no class. I'm sorry, I had planned a, a family trip since a long time. I hope that this would have been the third uh, week of lectures. Instead, it's the first one. So I have prepared the homework for you. So I will uh, assign you the homework through the Google group. Uh, you will be required to look at some past videos on service robotics and then probably to fill in a Google form uh, with your comments and replies. Okay, so this will be your task. Uh, more or less, you will devote three hours of time to this, so exactly the three hours that you have been spending with me remotely or in the class. Okay, so thank you for listening. <laughs>